Hey everybody, I got an interesting topic to talk about today, and that's gonna be Corey Duell's eight ball pattern rack. I know, it's kinda of controversial, but it's fun, right? So in this video, we're gonna be talking about when he used it for the first time, kind of the controversy around it, um, how it's done and what you should expect when you use it. But most importantly, I'm gonna be talking about my experience using it because I did a little bit of an experiment this past league season. So let's get at her. First of all, I just wanna say thanks everybody for coming back and watching another one of my videos. If you've never been to my channel before, I do like to do a lot of pool videos, but I do sprinkle in some other stuff, some storytelling, some movies and short stuff that I work on. So please, if you haven't before, hit subscribe and like this video if you like the content. So um, let's get right into it. So this is uh, tournament footage from 2015, I believe. And I want you to just watch what Corey does here and listen to the announcers because it's actually kind of funny and we're going to come back to the table and we're going to talk about what the actual pattern is and what you should expect and uh he's done that look at that all seven solids all seven stripes right by the triangle so he's going nowhere near those you can be sure but the rack is perfectly legal to do that as long as you've got the alternates in the corners and the eight in the middle. I can't repeat the pattern rack after rack, but he hasn't done that. He's changed them up. But this guy's a mad scientist when it comes to racking and breaking. Don't hear anything. Eleven inside. Yep, last one rolling. The uh, World PPA event has also, uh, you know, been run in conjunction with this. It's a standalone event. Uh, they're using the same nine footers that we used for the US Open one pocket. This is, of course, their final day, but that doesn't minimize the quality of the action we're gonna have for you and the excitement we're gonna have for the rest of the day. Really nice break. So let's see if, uh, all right, there's there's three stripes up top again. That alternate row three. This should be all solids if he's gonna do it again. And he is. And he's got to hold his serve. I hit those much harder than the last couple of times. It, it really didn't seem like he hit them as square. Uh, the cue ball glanced differently than it has been. Well, it's kind of obvious after watching that that Corey has figured out a way to segregate the balls in a certain manner to give himself a bit of a leg up. So all the solids, they kind of uh, situate themselves together, all the stripes together, and that eight ball's open, and the table's open for him. But let's, in case you didn't see, let's go take a look at the table here and the exact pattern. So you've got the solids, three solids, and then actually a fourth solid right over there on the left side. Obviously the eight ball has to go in the center. And then obviously for most rules, you have to have differing suits on the corners. And he's taken that into account here. So in his pattern, he's got those four solids and then the eight ball in the center, which is normal. But then he goes solid and then he goes a full row of stripes. And then two solids, stripe, solid, stripe. The way I envision it is, you know, on the fly when you're racking this rack is, I kind of notice this triangle here and that helps me and obviously the four stripes going across is a pretty w easy way to remember it as well. well. So whatever you gotta do to remember the pattern, but the more you do it, the faster you can become. So obviously you guys noticed something in that video, right? They were using 
the magic rack. So, you know, the magic rack, it increases your probability of predictability. That's what I like to say. It becomes very predictable on, if you hit things a certain way on the brake, you can predict what certain balls go in. And obviously the danger is this. You know, Corey went, the mad scientist they call him, right? And he went and he developed this little pattern that's gonna give him what he thinks is an advantage at the table. So that's what he did. But you can't always use this thing, right? You can't always use it. So what happens when this is taken away, right? Let's go over the leaks. So any of you league players, APA, CPA, you don't even rack your own in those leagues. So obviously this isn't for you because your opponent's gonna be racking for you. BCA and VNEA are two different stories. In BCA, you can use this. However, they do have a rule. In BCA, they say the other balls are placed in the triangle without purposeful or intentional pattern. In VNEA, you are not allowed to use this. So that goes out the window. So if you rack like this in VNEA, and you're allowed to rack like this in VNEA because there's no such thing as a pattern rack in VNEA, you just have to put the eight ball in the center and these two outside balls have to be different. Exactly like BCA, except BCA has that rule where they say, where they talk about patterns. Now, you could argue what constitutes a pattern. What if you went and changed it up so that, okay, you don't like how I racked them like that? Okay, well then I'll just do this. Okay, I changed it up, right? Different pattern, right? What's your definition of a pattern? I know this is uh, kind of a debating point. Like most people are gonna say that this is a pattern rack. But if you wanna be argumentative and uh, confrontational, maybe you just do what I just did. <laughs> but that being said, you know what you can and can't use in those certain leagues and also, if you go to a house tournament or a bigger tournament, you know, just clarify, are we playing VNEA rules? Are we playing BCA rules? You know, they're basically the same, except BCA does have that one little thing that's different, that makes it more difficult to rack them in this manner. Now, I had decided to take a little bit of a break uh, some years ago from playing actual team play. So uh, I didn't want to be a welder anymore. So I went back to school and uh, I started learning about cinematography and some of the work that you're, you guys are seeing now. But um, a friend of mine, Frank, actually called me up and said, hey, you wanna play teams again? And I said, you know what? That'll be fun. So I decided to come out of my retirement and start playing some teams. And lo and behold, my friend sent me this diagram, this actual pattern. And all he said was, rack the balls like this and break second ball. So that's what I did. And I noticed right away that the tables that I was getting were favorable. Let's just say favorable. Because he didn't really go into too deep of depth on how to break it, how hard to break it, all that jazz. But uh, I was breaking second ball and I was getting favorable results. So I decided to actually do a bit of an experiment. I said, the entire year, I'm gonna use this pattern rack <laughs> for all of my breaks. So, and I decided to track it. And then at the end of the year, I was gonna make a video, which is the one I'm making right now. So it was important for me to track my breaks and track how many times I ran out on my breaks. So because of COVID, uh, they decided to knock out one of our players and have only four-man teams because they thought that that would help with numbers, uh, bodies in, in, in our establishments that we play out of. So we went down to four-man teams. So that meant that we had two breaks each. Unfortunately, we had an uh, outbreak in Edmonton here and they decided to shut down all the establishments where we were playing league out of. So we 
only got eight weeks in. So that meant, and then they canceled the season on us. I forgot to mention that. So anyways, it didn't matter. I had eight weeks of play in and I tracked it on all my breaks, all my runouts, what I got. And I ended up with seven EROs out of 16 breaks, right? Because eight weeks, two breaks per week, 16 breaks. Seven of EROs, six of those EROs were on my break. The other one was uh, my friend Bruce here. <laughs> he broke huge and didn't sink a ball, so I punished him. But so, six out of the seven EROs I did on my break. What's crazy is I could have actually had nine EROs off of my break using this pattern rack out of 16 breaks, but I actually hung three eight balls this season, so I tracked that as well. So that wasn't good. But if I would have been at nine, like as it is right now, six EROs out of 16 attempts is 0.375 runout percentage. If I would have sunk those three eight balls, I would have been over 50% on my break running out, which is pretty good. It's pretty good just at 0.375 to run out. So um, does it work? Should I give you my final analysis right now is, yeah, <laughs> it works. It does segregate the balls to a degree that does give you an advantage. However, I had to change things up because I play in the VNEA pool league and I had just told you guys that we're not allowed to use the magic rack. So all that predictability that Corey had in that tournament is gone. So I had to change the rack up myself. So I guess the learning lesson here is, is depending on the table that you're on, you're gonna have to change it up. You're gonna have to change it up somewhat. So you can use the same pattern, but you're gonna have to change up how hard you're hitting it, maybe the amount of juice that you're throwing on that cue ball to make it do what you want it to do, which is come back off the side rail back into the pack. So. I'm gonna show you how I adjusted things. Now, because I don't get to use the magic rack, you know, I had to develop the second ball break. I have to hit it harder than what Corey was doing to pull it back to this side rail and over into the rack to try to get that eight ball out. Also, I'm not hitting exactly perfectly on the second ball. I find that a little bit left on that second ball helps me make the wing ball in the corner. So on my break, basically the things I'm trying to do is hit just a little bit left on the second ball, bring that cue ball back, hopefully into the rack here. And maybe that cue ball ends up in this general area, the eight ball pops out and I'm trying to make that, that wing ball. Oh, I lost that, but I made the wing ball. So I lost the cue ball there. But take a look at the layout. Take a look at this layout. We've got these groupings, but look at the, look at the low balls, right? That's just a small example. I, I did lose the cue ball there, right? So it wasn't hit perfectly. But the more you practice this, the more you're gonna see that it does give favorable layouts. I mean, First shot here is probably the four on the side, play down for the one and you're off to the races. Your only trouble ball is maybe the eight ball and you might be able to even break that eight ball out off of the one. The biggest thing for me, the way I've adjusted this system is uh, you really have to make sure that this is tight, but um, you know, because I've moved that, that contact point over, it's really easy to lose that cue ball, right? But I've moved it over because I found that when I do, I'm making that wing ball more often than not. This is my last one. So again, I kind of lost that cue ball. It did go in to the rack and you've got this conglomeration again here, right? And then you've got the separation. So yeah, there's one trouble ball, but do you get my point? This is something that you guys can try. 
Um, obviously, if you're going to be playing on an eight foot and a nine foot, again, it's going to adjust, you're going to have to adjust things. But if you want repeatability and predictability, just use a magic rack at the start to try to figure, figure it out. And then get rid of the magic rack if you have to learn it on that size of table without a magic rack. But you know, you, you may have to adjust it. On a nine foot, it's way different for, than, a, than a seven foot, right? So the key learning about this pattern rack is you want your cue ball to be hitting the second ball. You want the cue ball to be coming back and going back into the, into the pack, right? The theory behind it is that's gonna help pop the eight ball out to a spot that hopefully isn't tied up. You know, another thing to think about is that, you know, if you want to avoid confrontation and letting people know that you're actually using this, this pattern is, you know, get, get faster at it, get, get better at it. So if you're one of these people that, you know, people are going to raise their eyebrows at that. Whereas if you're just throwing them in there, You get moving, you know, people are, they're not even going to think twice about it, right? And you can, I don't want to say you and sneak it by them. I don't want to talk about the ethics of this. I just want to talk about, you know, does it work? You know, you really have to be because of how I, this is not a magic rack right? So how I've adjusted it, you really do have to be cognizant that those two balls, it's really tight in here, right? Look, I'm, I'm loose on the corner here. And that's the thing about not using a magic rack is it's taken away that predictability. You know, my table's hard to rack, right? This one keeps sliding off. Eventually I just get sick and tired because I want to hit balls. So I just move on, but you guys get the idea. a lot of stuff at you in this video I mean this was just a an interesting experiment for me to use this past season in uh, VNEA league and I thought I'd just you know talk to you guys about what I found and what I found is for this rack even though I couldn't use the magic rack I think it did give me an advantage I think I had a lot of favorable results there were many times and my captain knew that I was doing this um, he was sitting back and he was watching me. Like every time I broke, he watched. And a lot of times I'd look back at him and he would be looking back at me and uh, he would be smiling and shaking his head because I had open tables. I had a lot of cracks at it. I mean, I could have had even more EROs than what I did. I just ended up messing them up. But um, yeah, my final conclusion is uh, give it a try for yourself because it does give you uh, a really good layout. That being said, um, I read a really interesting article from Paul Pache uh, discussing the topic of pattern racking and it actually originated from all the controversy from Corey Duell and one of our local players up in Red Deer using it in a tournament that same year. His quote is this, in fact I have been racking the balls in 8-ball the same way for more than 40 years. So. Isn't that pattern racking? Of course it is. I bet there are hundreds of eight ball players that rack the balls the same way every time. They too are pattern racking. Why has no one ever had a problem with my eight ball rack? Because I rack them so that the stripe balls and the solid balls are spread out as evenly as possible, of course. So no one feels that I am racking them in a way that gives me an unfair advantage. I found that to be a really interesting take on the topic and it got me thinking 
And that is going to be the subject, the controlling idea about the next video that I make. It's going to be a fun, another experiment really, but it's going to be another fun video. And I'm excited to see what you guys can come up with because I'm going to give you guys some homework. So if you want to know when that video drops, by all means, hit the subscribe button and that bell notification. So when I upload it, you guys will get notified. And uh, I think that's going to be a fun little video. So I'm going to start working on that one as soon as I'm done editing this one. But again, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you on the flip side. Well, it's pretty obvious here that uh, Corey's figured out to segregate his balls 